Audrey, and uh, welcome everyone to the second webinar in our series on scientific and practical applications of lyophilization. Um, building on the first webinar, the second one is going to focus in on really trying to understand and characterize the thermal properties of our formulation. So this is the basis of starting any cycle development, and we even use this in formulation development when we're designing a formulation for freeze drying purposes. So we're going to go through and talk about um, some of the typical materials and the properties that we see of these in, in typical freeze dried products and understanding how those can impact the cycle, um, impact the formulation, and then also understand how we, uh, the analytical techniques that we use to understand what we have and the critical temperatures that are associated with those as well. Okay, um, like we mentioned last time, what is freeze drying or lyophilization? It's the process that we use to remove water or another solvent from a formulation. And the beauty of this is we do it at low temperatures, um, thereby avoiding thermal degradation of the product. And we do this through a process called sublimation, which uh, if you recall from the last webinar is converting the ice crystals directly from a solid to a vapor. That vapor leaves the product and sticks to the condenser away from the product. Again, why are we freeze drying? Well, the reason we freeze dry is um, because we have no choice. The product is unstable um, in the liquid state for an acceptable period of time. So by freeze drying, we put the product essentially in suspended animation to enhance the stability of the product. Okay, we're going to cover a couple of definitions here, and these are really going to follow us throughout the remainder of our webinars. Um, these are two types of systems we generally see in freeze-dried products that we, that we work with. The first of these is called a eutectic mixture, and when we say eutectic, we mean crystalline. So it's crystalline species that are in such close contact or an intimate mixture, two or more species, that they melt like a single pure uh, substance. So for those of you who took organic chemistry and the lab section of that, and at the end of the lab your professor gave you an unknown powder and said, with all the knowledge you've learned in your uh, coursework, identify this unknown powder. Um, the first and easiest thing we can do should be melting point. We know that pure substances melt at a very characteristic temperature. So what I'm telling you here is that we've got two crystalline species in such close contact that they melt like a single pure substance. Now one of those species is going to be, say, a crystalline um, uh, active ingredient, a crystalline excipient. The other is going to be tiny ice crystals, and we'll talk more about that as we go through the webinar. The second phase we generally see in freeze-dried products is called a glassy phase or an amorphous phase. Now amorphous means no order or structure to the system. So we think about a crystalline phase, when these molecules form a crystal, they line up in a very precise crystalline lattice. That's not the case with uh, glassy phases or amorphous phases. When these solidify, there's no order or structure to that solid phase. So that's, that's the difference. And these are two systems we generally see either individually or in combination in, in every freeze-dried product I've worked on over the years. All right, so let's kind of think about what's going on when we freeze a sample down and get ready to do primary drying. We start as a solution in the liquid state, and what we, this is, as we go down through the graph, this is decreasing in temperature. Start in the solution state, we start cooling. Well, we're going to hit a temperature, and a concentration where one of, uh, well, a temperature where, where one of two things is going to happen. What we would like to have happen is ice nucleation. So we, as we cool down, we build up all this potential energy. We get water molecules coming together, spinning around, trying to, trying to nucleate, flying apart until eventually those uh, two molecules under, overcome the activation energy and will form a nucleus. And when that happens, then we start growing ice crystals. One of the things that we might see that we don't necessarily want to see is solute crystallization. So if you think about, you start cooling a sample down and exceed the solubility limit of one of the components in your formulation, we can actually get that solute to start falling out of solution. It will settle to the bottom. If we freeze dry that way, it's probably going to form an insoluble crust when we try to reconstitute. So we don't like that happen, uh, happening. So let's assume we get ice nucleation. We continue to cool. 
and as we continue to cool um we grow the ice crystals. now this is where we get a phase separation between the different phases in the system pure ice crystals. so that's the first thing that happens. two molecules of water come together form a stable nucleus and then we start growing ice crystals. and that's pure ice only, only h two o. everything around those ice crystals, so is all the liquid that's surrounding the ice crystals is what we call the interstitial space. and within that interstitial space we have um, all the active ingredients, the excipients, buffers, anything we go in that formulation gets shoved around the ice crystals in that interstitial space. now as we continue to cool down and grow the ice crystals, the ice crystals are growing because they're pulling water out of that interstitial space. and when they do that, we super concentrate everything in that formulation within that interstitial space. this can be a damaging environment for certain unstable molecules. well finally, we hit a concentration and a temperature where one of four different things is going to happen. if we've got a crystalline species, uh, it's, it'll go ahead and form the eutectic, again with the remaining water in that, uh, in that interstitial space. if it's not going to form a crystal but it wants to form a glass, it'll solidify. and basically the glass, what it does is it gets thicker and thicker as it gets colder and colder and more water is pulled out until finally the viscosity gets so high it just forms a solid. With the eutectic, we're actually forming bonds. Okay, big difference here. We'll talk about that more as we go along. Sometimes we might see the metastable glass formed. And when we say metastable, we technically mean unstable. Um, this is a, a glassy phase that forms, so no order to this system. However, it should have crystallized and formed the, eutect uh, the eutectic. That's its most stable free energy state. For a number of different reasons, it didn't do that, but it should be there. The problem is, if we freeze dry a product, keep it in its metastable state, over time it's going to crystallize. The, la the laws of thermodynamics uh, state that that's going to happen. And when it does crystallize, it's going to wreak havoc on your formulation. So this is where we'd be talking about adding thermal treatment or a kneeling step to get rid of this, get rid of this metastable state. Lyotropic liquid crystals. This is something I've worked uh, through my entire career. We've only worked on one product that demonstrated liquid crystal uh, characteristics. So we don't, we're not going to focus on that. It's basically a system that shows some order in its structure but behaves more like a, an amorphous phase. So these three are going to be the ones we're working on. 75% of the formulations we've worked on for clients at, uh, at our facility have been either a glass, a stable glass, a eutectic, a mixture of both, 75%. 25% we do see the metastable glass where we would need to talk about adding a, an annealing step to get rid of that. All right, we talked about the different phases. Um, so the eutectic, it's got a melting temperature. Same thing with the glass transition. We call it a glass transition temperature. What's going on here? It's below this eutectic melting temperature, Te, that interstitial space or that eutectic in the interstitial space is a solid below that temperature. Uh, above that temperature it's a fluid. same thing with a glass transition temperature Tg prime. below Tg prime the interstitial space is a fluid, or I'm sorry a solid. above Tg prime it's a fluid. now why is this important? well we talk about getting the sample frozen. so as long as we're below the glass transition temperature, the eutectic melting temperature, everything in the, in the ice channels and the interstitial space is going to be a solid. then we start primary drying. the goal of primary drying is to remove the ice in the ice channels. all the crystalline ice in the ice channels is removed during primary drying or should be removed during primary drying. now let's think about this. if we're freeze drying, now we freeze the sample, it's solid, we start removing the ice. now ice also acts as scaffolding to hold up the physical structure of our, of our frozen solid. now if we're removing the scaffolding of ice, and say we're above the glass transition temperature or the eutectic melting temperature, the interstitial space is a fluid. so we start pulling the scaffolding out, which is the ice, through primary drying, and if what's left over is a fluid, this is where we're going to get collapse, or melt back, not necessarily melt back, but uh, loss of structure of the product. So essentially we dry above these critical temperatures and we're left with a puddle of goo at the bottom of the vial. Okay, we don't want that, obviously. 
Um, these are measured through uh, thermal analysis techniques, which we'll talk more about as we go along. The collapse temperature is always done with a uh, freeze dry microscopy system or another suitable system. Um, and we'll talk about how these two different techniques complement each other and why we like using both of them when we do a thermal characterization study uh, for a client. Okay, so why are these important? Why are the glass transition temperatures, eutectic melting temperatures important? Because for the most part, these temperatures represent the warmest temperature we can take our product during primary drying without it losing structure or collapsing in the bottom of the vial. All right, we'll say a little bit about unfrozen water. And this goes back to or, or talks about why we would need to differentiate between amorphous phases or glassy phases and crystalline phases in our formulation. They hold on to water very differently. Um, when something freezes and forms a crystalline eutectic, the water molecules are essentially kicked out of the crystalline lattice. There's no, for, uh, no room for them in there. However, that's different with an amorphous solid or glassy phase. It actually embeds moisture into that glassy matrix, sometimes up you know, 10 to 50 percent of the entire, uh, the entire moisture of that formulation. So again, understanding that helps us uh, optimize our secondary drying protocol, knowing how and where water is trapped in our formulation. Again, these two species dry very differently, secondary drying and primary drying. So how we develop the cycle, um, we, we have to know what we have. Is it crystalline? Is it amorphous? Is it a mixed system? And again, like we mentioned before, in prim primary drying, we need to stay below that TG prime, glass transition temperature, or eutectic melting temperature, or we do run the risk of complete structural loss of the product during primary drying, collapse. Um, this is a diagram just showing you, again, what what we're looking at, again, between a crystalline solute and a amorphous solute. What we see here are the ice and the ice channels. We like nice, wide ice channels because that facilitates water vapor transfer. Um, once we create the water through sublimation, the water vapor through sublimation. In the interstitial space here, in this particular case, this would be our eutectic, so crystalline phases in here. Um, same thing here, we have the ice channels. Um, the glassy phase, however, here in the interstitial space has a high water content. That's unfrozen water that's bound in there or locked in that glassy phase. Much more difficult to get out here than it is in a crystalline eutectic phase. Okay, it's secondary drying for the amorphous phases. Water must diffuse to the surface of the glass before vaporization. Very, very slow process. We can actually damage our product or collapse the product on our ramp to secondary drying if we're not careful. Very differently with crystalline, at the end of primary drying for a completely crystalline formulation, we're already 99.99% dry. And again, complete collapse of the product, horrible product, high moisture. We've shut down the ice channels so there's no pores in here to help rehydrate the product. Stability is going to be terrible, most likely. Reconstitution time is going to be terrible, so not a uh, situation we want to be in. This just shows you uh, uh, the house of horrors of freeze drying. This one actually looks pretty good. This one's collapsed in on itself. Basically, what happened here is that there was still a little bit of ice left over um, before we ramped the secondary drying, so primary drying was not complete. Well, what happens as we ramp the secondary drying, if there's still ice, once the product temperature exceeds zero degrees Celsius, that ice is going to melt, and it's going to take down some of the material that's dried above it, okay? So collapsing at the center. Sometimes it'll manifest itself as a ring, a dissolved ring of material on the bottom of the vial. This one shows bubbles. Now, these are uh, this is a rigid, hard solid, but it's got these bubbles entrapped inside of it. This was drying at a temperature above the glass transition temperature. So like I mentioned, ice was still present, holding up the structure. The interstitial space was a fluid. Well, when you turn on the vacuum, a very high vacuum in primary drying, you create a, a situation where that sample will boil at sub-zero temperatures. So that's what's happening. It's boiling, and as it's boiling, it's releasing the moisture. What we have here is what's uh, 
technically termed a vacuum dried glass, not, the, not a freeze dried product. This one, get a better view here, showing the side of the vial, um, shows these splashes on the side of the vial, freeze dried uh, pieces that have, that have splashed up. Now the question becomes, how do we get material on the side of the vial? Most cases, the issue is they, the vials have been uh, handled roughly after filling or even dur during filling. If we fill too quickly, we can spray uh, product up on the side of the vial, or once they're filled and they travel down the line, if they get shaken up, we can get product on the side of the vial. Um, if we're doing a manual load or even a robotic load, if we're not careful on how those vials are handled, we can get spraying to the side of the vial. Uh, we'll go back to that. Now the problem here becomes, is this an issue other than being cosmetic? I mean, it looks terrible. Uh, and the answer is yes, it could be an issue more than a cosmetic issue. In some cases I've seen, um, we'll freeze dry product and we'll get splashing, but while the cake looks good and freeze dried, the, the uh, drops on the side of the vial don't freeze dry and actually collapse. So we've got a nice freeze dried cake and these sticky globs on the, on the side of the vial. That's, that's not a good situation. Some of the other scenarios, this is called phase separation or ring formation. That is a classic example of problems with the freezing protocol. That completely, uh, again, boiled. We dried it at too high temperature. Um, all the material bubbled up the side of the vial as it boiled. This one's got some cracks. That's not necessarily a bad thing. Some excipients or active ingredients nat naturally will crack and pull away from the side of the vial. This one's in complete collapse, and that one looks pretty good. All right, this was an example that came through our facility. Most of the vials came out looking like this, nice intact cakes. About 7 or 8% came out looking like this, which had these tiny little pores that have opened up. Now, when we get a failure like this, um, the question we have to ask ourselves, if it's a partial failure, well, where were the vials located? Location can mean everything. In this particular case, these vials were around the edge of the shelf and suffered from something we call edge effect. Um, edge effect is where the vials see a slightly warmer environment on the outside. Um, in this particular case, these vials got slightly too warm, started to get too close to the glass transition, and partially collapsed. So that's what we would call a partial collapse. Uh, this one's melt back, like I mentioned. Sometimes it will manifest itself as a dissolved ring of material around the bottom of the vial. Uh, again, we did not stay long enough in primary drying, ramped up to secondary, and the ice that was on the bottom went, uh, went ahead and melted and then dissolved some of the cake at the bottom. Cake shrinkage, again, this is something that came out of the freeze dryer looking like this, nice cakes, a little bit of shrinkage. A month later, they look like that. So again, somehow moisture is getting into those samples. Okay, we talked about the critical temperatures in freeze drying with the eutectic and glass transition temperatures being uh, representing the warmest temperatures we can go for most cases. Um, without losing structure. Well, how do, we, how do we measure that? How do we determine what we have and those critical temperatures that are associated with it? The way we do it, these first four bullet points are what we call thermal analysis. That last bullet point, so we, we conduct one of these techniques, and we always back that up with freeze dry microscopy. These two techniques supplement, uh, supplement each other. So we get the complete thermal picture of our formulation by doing, you know, freeze dry microscopy with one of these other techniques. We're going to talk about these. DSC is the gold standard or modulated DSC. We have a modulated in our lab. Um, these are some older techniques. We'll just kind of brush on a little bit, but uh, hopefully most people are using it. Well, anybody doing uh, uh, current uh, thermal characterization should be using a DSC backed up with the freeze dry microscopy. Okay, we'll have to think back to our physical chemistry days. Um, anytime there's a physical or chemical change in a, in a substance, it will either absorb or give off a little heat to the environment, what we call an ex exothermic or endothermic reaction. That's what this, these instruments are picking up, the heat that's given off or absorbed as our substances go through these crystallization, uh, freezing, melting, glass transition events. That's what we're picking up with our instrumentation. 
Uh, most common types of thermal analysis, DSC by far. Older technology, we'll say a little bit about differential thermal analysis. Some of the other techniques we'll talk about is thermoelectric analysis. This one's very limited in what it can tell you, but if you're doing very simple systems, very simple crystalline systems, you know, it might be an alternative for you to use. It's, it's dirt cheap uh, as opposed to some of the other techniques as well. In differential thermal analysis, basically we take a sample of our product. Now this should be a sample as if we were going to directly put it in a vial like our real product and freeze dry it. So we've got to have everything in it, same concentration, etc. That goes in the sample well. In the reference well, we put a material called alumina. It's not going to change, it's not going to give off or absorb heat um, as we change the temperature of the, of the sample in the reference cell. Basically what we're looking at is we'll take the sample cup and the reference cup, cool them from room temperature down to some sub-zero temperature, the sample will freeze, the reference won't, we'll hold them at that low temperature, then we'll ramp them up, the sample will go through its glass transition, its eutectic melt, the reference won't, and we're measuring the delta T or the change in temperature between the sample cup and the reference cup. And basically this is the graph we get at. So this is the temperature, we're moving the sample, this is the change in temperature between the sample and the reference, and we're only looking at the warming, so we warm, 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 boom, the sample goes through a eutectic melt, and we see this big jump in delta T. Now, what does this tell me? Well, it tells me if I'm going to be freeze drying, I need to be down here somewhere, uh, because down here, you know, below negative 33, negative 35, the interstitial space is a solid, and we know we want that to be a solid during primary drying. If I'm drying up here, interstitial space is a fluid, and we will melt or go through a eutectic milk, and you'll end up with a total collapse of the product, a puddle of goo in the bottom of the vial. This is the instrument, very simple technology. Again, sample cup with sample reference, thermocouples measuring each. It's been used, DTA has been used more frequently in the past because it's older technology, it's cheaper. Um, Delta T depends on a number of different things, but the, the thing I want to point out, you can't make quantitative thermodynamic uh, measurements, uh, calorimetric measurements with this. Um, we can del tell the delta T, but you're not going to be able to get some of these other measurements. You may not want them, uh, but we'll talk about some of the advantages that the DSC allows us to do. Um, we'll talk about thermoelectric. This basically, it's a... Uh, probes, um, and basically what we'll do is we'll stick these two probes in the solution. Um, we'll put a current across them, plug it in, put a current. Now in the liquid state with ions in the solution, it very, it's very easy to pass a current between the two electrodes. Um, so basically what we see, very low resistance. Now as we cool the sample down and freeze it solid, it locks up those ions and they can't carry a charge or it's very difficult. So we'll see the resistance to current flow go through the roof. That's what we're measuring, resistance to current flow. So we freeze the sample down, high resistance. As we warm up and go through our, our eutectic melt, we see the curve, the resistance drop sharply because now once those ions are freed up, they can carry the charge much easier. Uh, I'm not going to uh, list uh, go through the required equipment again. Uh, SP Scientific, SP Industries sells these little probes. You can fit right in the vial. They come with a 20 millimeter neck. You plug it into your uh, side of the freeze dryer, and ta-da, you got a TEA. Okay, we talked about the resistance dropping sharply as we uh, go through the uh, thermal events. Okay, down here we're frozen, negative probably 70-ish, high resistance as we warm, boom, we see this big drop in resistance. We take the second derivative, we see a point, so that tells me at about negative 30, if we get too much above negative 30, that interstitial space forms a fluid, and if we try to freeze dry above that, we're going to get collapse. So what we see here, again, the system is very good for simple formulations, one component formulations that do have some crystallinity to them. Manitol is not really a crystalline species, but we actually do get a pretty good response for it. So down here, the mannitol, 5% in water, um, frozen at negative 60. We warm, boom, we see the drop. It's very characteristic of mannitol. It's got a eutectic melt, a eutectic melt not too far below zero. 
Now, the results become difficult to interpret if we start to add multiple components to a formulation. Um, let's just walk through a few examples. This one's sodium chloride and mannitol at this ratio here. Uh, we freeze the sample, we're warming up. Boom, we see the transition. That's very characteristic of a detected melt of sodium chloride, which is negative 21.5, 21.5. Um, and then we keep going, we see the mannitol transition as well. When we change the ratio, uh, I don't know what we get. There's multiple transitions going on. We don't know what they represent. So again, it becomes much more difficult to interpret what's going on with this. So again, as I mentioned, this technique's good for simple eutectic systems, have some ionic species in them. Um, again, when we start talking about glass transition and very complex formulations, it becomes uh, very difficult to interpret. So we get the DSC, the gold standard. In this particular case, it's the same deal. We have a sample of our uh, sample. So it's formulated exactly as if we were going to freeze dry it in a vial or a tray. And then the reference is just an empty sample pan. These are little aluminum discs, little aluminum sample pans. The reference pan is empty. We seal it empty. Um, so basically, it's the same deal. <clears throat> Take the sample pan and the reference at zero or, uh, room temperature, cool them down. In, in the DSC, we can go down to negative 90. So we cool down to negative 90, hold it for a few minutes, and then warm it up to room temperature and look at the transitions. Now, the difference between differential scanning calorimetry and differential uh, temperature uh, analysis. Differential temperature analysis, we're simply measuring the change in temperature between the reference cell and the sample cell. In DSC, we're measuring the difference in heat flow. What does that mean? The DSC, as we cool down and heat up, keeps the sample and the reference at the same temperature the whole time. So what happens is we cool down and say the sample pan or the sample nucleates and crystallizes, there's going to be a burst of heat given off. Well, basically, the sample, the, the DSC will uh, warm the, you know, equalize the, the temperature so it supplies energy or takes energy away from the reference pan to keep them at the same temperature. So now we're not measuring delta T, we're measuring the energy that's required to keep those two pans at the same temperature. And basically, change in temperature, increase in temperature, we control the heating rate, that's what we program in. The heat flow is the energy or the amount, you know, the amount of energy that's put in to keep the pans at the same temperature. Now, the beauty of this, we monitor the heat flow. We program in the heating rate. If we divide the heat flow by the heating rate, we can now extract out some of the thermodynamic variables we might be interested in, starting with the heat capacity. Now, heat capacity, uh, the definition is the amount of energy required to raise the temperature of one gram of a species one degree Celsius. It takes a different amount of energy to do that for different materials. Okay, so each different material has a different heat capacity. If we integrate the heat capacity as a function of a temperature range, we can then extract the enthalpy or the total amount of energy that was required for that amount of substance, okay, to go through that transition. And sometimes we might be interested in that. If we're doing a study to say, well, if I put more crystalline species in, formulation, how does that change my enthalpy? Great. Uh, how many clients, when we do this work for clients, ask us for the enthalpy? One or two in my entire career. Most of them uh, don't really care about the energy that's involved. They're only looking at, you know, having us identify what is it, crystalline amorphous, and what are the temperatures that are associated with it. Um, we can also take the enthalpy, divide it over the, the temperature, the melt temperature, and get the entropy of that reaction as well, if we wanted. Here's the DSC in our lab. Uh, it's a TA instrument. It's a very good, very reliable instrument. We use them and recommend them. Um, ours is a very simple unit, meaning it's manually loaded. Um, these things go all the way up the, the pay scale um, with all the bells and whistles, so you can get uh, auto loaders, anything you want for these things, but we want the simple system. The pan, uh, reference pan sits in the back. It's got a little pedestal. Sample, sample pan sits in the front on its own little pedestal. Uh, we use very small volumes. Uh, we've got 7 to 10 microliters here. 
I'm using more like 18 these days, 18 microliters, just for the simple fact that um, the sensitivity of the instrument does depend on the amount of sample we put in. We don't want to overload it, but uh, especially some uh, low energy events that we might see, which we'll talk about. So 18 is about what we're using these days, 18 to 20. Now, when using DSC for thermal character, thermal analysis, we get two curves that are generated. One, the cooling curve. We start at room temperature, we cool down, we have a curve for that. We warm up from that uh, frozen state, we get a warming curve for that. Now, we don't use the cooling curve other than looking at it. The issue is things always melt at a character at a very precise temperature. Things do not always crystallize or freeze at a characteristic temperature. So we kind of have to take that with a grain of salt, and the best way to show this is with a graph. Bottom curve is the cooling curve. We're cooling, boom, crystallization. That's the ice crystals forming. Go down to, in this case, they went down to 65. Top curve is warming, boom, there's that system melting. Notice the difference in temperature. Now, I look at this cooling curve because, I mean, if, if it's not freezing till somewhere down here, we got a problem. So I look at it to make sure we're freezing somewhere about negative 10, negative 20, that's fine, and then I cut it off and only look at the warming curve. The warming curve is going to give us a lot of information. Not only what are we dealing with, crystalline, amorphous, um, but also the critical temperatures that are associated with it. So here, for example, let's look at a standard eutectic melt. We warm, 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 see this nice sharp peak, symmetrical in shape. Classic example of a eutectic melt. Um, anytime we have a eutectic melt, you're going to see a nice sharp peak. Um, you'll never miss this. It's a high energy event. Um, let's contrast that with a glass. Now the glass, we warm up, it goes through this characteristic what we call the S-curve. Um, so just by the shape of these curves, I know what it is. Um, let's look at the metastable glass. How do I know it's metastable? Well, we warm up. If it's a glassy phase, it's going to have a glass transition. We warm up. There's my glass transition right here. We see a little bump, uh, uh, an endotherm. That's called um, enthalpy recovery. And then, boom, we see crystallization by this big exotherm. So what's this telling me? Well, we know we formed a glass. It's metastable. We warm it up. Once we get through the glass transition, as I mentioned earlier, we're no longer a solid. We're a fluid. So the molecules got locked in a uh, uh, random distribution when they froze, metastable glass. As we go through the glass transition, those molecules start to move. As they move, they settle in and crystallize, and that's why we see this big kick out of heat as those samples nucleate and, and form, form the eutectic. Okay, great. Now the temperature that we use. So a eutectic, the software on our TA Instruments DSC draws a tangent to the leading baseline, a tangent to the front end of the peak, and where those points intersect, where those lines intersect, is what we report as the onset of the eutectic metal. Glass transition, there's several temperatures we could report. Uh, generally, most widely accepted is the midpoint. So we tell our computer to draw a tangent to the leading baseline, a tangent to the trailing baseline. The midpoint, uh, where those, uh, between those lines, is what we call TG prime. Okay? Now you'll notice the noise in this baseline is very noisy compared to the others. That is because we've had to magnify this, this transition to get it to show up with these other transitions. It's a very low energy thermal event. Think about it. When we go through a eutectic melt, we're breaking bonds, tearing crystals apart. Thermodynamically, it's a pretty high energy event. Glass transition, all it is is a slight, it's a shift in viscosity. So below the TG prime, we have a rigid solid. As it warms up, the molecules start to flow. There's no breaking of bonds, no crystals tearing apart, low energy event. Unless we look for this, we won't find it. We won't see it. Okay, so we always have to go back at our baseline and look for this. This tells me a couple of things. Tells me my potential annealing conditions. Uh, so I want to be above this. I want to be annealing somewhere right around here, whatever that temperature is. I don't want to get too warm because I don't want to melt the ice. There's still ice present in this formulation, but I want to get through the glass transition, the crystallization event, so this would be a good temperature for annealing. Okay, let's wrap it up with freeze-dry microscopy, then we'll open the floor for some questions.
Freeze drying microscopy is a direct examination of freezing and freeze drying by a special stage uh, and a microscope. It complements and supports the information from the DSC. So we like to have both the DSC information and the freeze dry microscopy information because it gives us the complete picture of our of our product. All right, here's the instrument in our lab. It's uh, from McCrone Microscopes out of Chicago. They're the only company in the United States that distributes these. Um, basically, it's a tiny freeze dryer that sits on our polarized light microscope. It's cooled with liquid nitrogen. Um, it's got a liquid nitrogen pump and a controller. Um, there's a window here, and we put a, a drop of sample, about five microliters, and we put another window on top, seal the chamber, freeze the sample down, and start, uh, start drying, collecting images. So a little bit about polarized light microscopy theory. In addition to allowing us to determine critical temperatures, collapse temperatures, it also gives us an idea of the crystallinity of our formulation. So basically, we talk about something forming a crystal. An amorphous material forms no crystals. It's not going to refract the light. Um, we don't see much of that. With uh, uh, birefringent crystals, uh, isotropic crystals, and an anisotropic crystal, we see vast differences. So we think about, like, sodium chloride is a good example of an isotropic crystal. Um, and basically what that means, if I had a crystal of sodium chloride, a big crystal, and I, I could actually see the ions in it, I would see sodium chloride, sodium chloride, and no matter how I turn that crystal around, I'd see the same arrangement of the ions in the crystal. An anisotropic crystal is different. It's got crystallographically distinct axes. axis, axes. Um, so if I had a chunk of this crystal, I would look at this end, I would see this end of the molecule. If I turned it over, I'd see a different end of the molecule. So uh, the molecular structure in the crystal is dependent upon our field of view. These bend light differently. Isotropic crystals, again, we talked about have equivalent axes. Um, they bend the light or refract the light at a constant angle as it passes through the crystal. Uh, great. Anisotropic crystals behave a little differently. They still refract the light, but because of the nature of the crystal, it breaks the light into two rays, one that are perpendicular, uh, perpendicular to each other, and they travel at different velocities. It's what we call the uh, ordinary and extraordinary rays. Now let's think about this, what's going on under our microscope. Basically, we have white light coming in, fine, now there is a filter in here. It's a magenta filter, 530 nanometer uh, wave plate. And what that allows us to do is as the light passes through that filter, it brings everything up into our visual uh, realm so we can see color, okay? So we bring the light through a polarizer so we get plain polarized light. It then passes through our sample. Now if our sample has the anisotropic crystals, we see it broken, breaks the waves, into the uh, perpendicular waves, the ordinary and extraordinary waves. We then pass it out through the analyte, I'm sorry, excuse me, an analyzer, which is another polarizer. What that does is it takes pieces of both of those waves and we get essentially retardation in the wavelength. So this slows down or speeds up and we see that as changes in uh, the wavelength or color, if you will. So the extraordinary and ordinary rays emerging from the crystal are still vibrating at right angles. And just like I said, when it goes through the analyzer, it takes pieces of both of those when it plain polarizes that light again. So we do see shifts in the wavelength uh, showing us color. I'm not going to go through the technique. This is, again, something that we do in our lab. If you do have this technique available in your facility, this is the technique that we use. Um, it's relatively simple. We put the windows down. Um, we do use a small amount of silicon oil between the uh, sample block and the, the quartz bottom window. That helps with heat transfer and also provides lubricity because we can actually move that sample around um, under the microscope while it's freeze drying. Uh, again, different technique, uh, some of the technique here. All right, let's show you some images that we capture under the microscope. Now, what we see here, these squiggly lines. That's ice. Now, I will tell you we've manipulated this sample a little bit to exaggerate the ice crystals. Um, you wouldn't normally see it like this. But we wanted to show you the difference between the ice structure and the ice channels and the interstitial space. Now, what you can 
see very clearly is in the interstitial space, we see these tiny crystals, and there's a little bit of color associated with them, birefringent crystals. Okay, we're below the, the ice melt. Obviously, we still have ice. We're below the eutectic melting temperature because the interstitial space is a solid. Now, if we warm up in this next image, we're still below zero, so we still have ice in the ice channels. However, the interstitial space is fluid ice. We've exceeded the eutectic melting temperature. Let's take a look in amorphous phase. Um, we freeze the sample down. Now, what you'll see here, this is all the same sample. The differences in color represent our field of view to what end of the crystal, the birefringent crystal, we're seeing. So say we see blue, we're seeing this face of the crystal. So say in orange, we're seeing this face of the crystal. Maybe a red, we're seeing this face of the crystal. So it's dependent on our field of view to how the crystals have, have formed in our, in, our, in our frozen sample. So we collect an image in the frozen state. We then kick on the, the vacuum and start primary drying. In this case, it's 45 degrees C, so we're getting an intact dried layer. If we were not getting an intact dried layer, we'd see pores start to open up, or we'd see uh, magenta coming through. And again, magenta is the color of our filter, so we'd start to see light coming through that was magenta. Here's the frozen layer, the dried layer. Here's our sublimation front. That's where we have um, sublimation going on. It's a razor-thin line between the frozen layer and the dried layer where active sublimation is occurring. Once we collect this image, we then start warming the sample up and collecting images. We want to force this into a state of collapse so we know what temperature it goes through that collapsing event. Okay, boom. So we're back here. We're warming, warming, warming. We finally hit a temperature that exceeds the glass transition temperature. And like I mentioned, once we exceed the glass transition temperature, the interstitial space becomes a fluid. Sample can't support its own weight, and we get collapsed. Now, you'll notice the frozen layer is still intact because there's still ice in there that's providing scaffolding for the sample. <coughs> Excuse me. All right, so what have we learned from this webinar? Well, thermal analysis studies, thermal characterization studies, DSC, freeze-dry microscopy, have given us several key pieces of information. They tell us, is the system crystalline? Does it form a eutectic? Is it amorphous? Does it form a glassy phase? What are, the, what are the critical temperatures that are associated with those different phases as well? Tells if we need to anneal the system and approximately what conditions those would be. Okay, so thermal analysis or thermal characterization allows us to take an empirical or scientific approach to lyophilization cycle development. And I can't stress how important it is to have this information. Um, if you're developing cycles in-house, this will give you so much information um, that you'll need for cycle development. So, for example, in years ago when I was doing cycle development uh, without this information, it may take us 15 or 20 pilot runs in a freeze dryer to get something that worked, and it probably wasn't optimized. By doing the thermal characterization, it, now when we develop a cycle for clients, we can do it in three runs. Develop a fully optimized cycle in three runs, and then we always do a confirmation run. So that's you know, vastly different than what we used to do in the past, number one. Number two, if you're developing a drug and you submit freeze drying as part of your new drug application, the FDA is going to ask you about, is it a glassy phase? What are the glass transition temperatures, collapse temperatures? So it's very important to have that information as well because the FDA is going to ask you those questions. Okay, now uh, we're going to open up the floor for questions. I did include my email address on the first slide, and of course you can always reach me through our website at abbiotechnology.com. Uh, ab um, so if there's any questions outside of this or any additional questions I can answer, feel free to, to email me. Um, with that, we'll turn it back to Audrey and we'll open the floor for questions. Okay, so it looks like we've got a question coming through. The question is, can a vacuum pump failure during freeze drying cause meltback? The answer is absolutely. What happens if we lose vacuum in the chamber? Obviously, the pressure goes up. As the pressure goes up, um, the heat transfer, and this is getting a little bit out of the webinar, uh, more in a future webinar, the heat transfer uh, changes between the shelf and the product, so product temperature will rise. So as chamber pressure rises, product temperature rises until we can exceed 
go through a eutectic melt, a glass transition, or actually even melt the product. So, yeah, absolutely. Okay, next question. Um, how far from your TG or TE should we set the primary drying temperature? That's a great question, and we're going to discuss that in detail uh, in the next webinar or the one after that. Basically, there is going to be a temperature differential. You are correct. Product temperature is always going to run colder than shelf temperature, and we won't know that. Each product is going to be different. Each cycle is going to be different. So this is where we would go to our pilot scale freeze dryer and start working out those conditions to make sure we keep shelf temperature uh, appropriate to where product temperature is kept below the TG prime and the eutectic melt. That's a great question, and we will cover that in detail in a future webinar as part of this series. Really become important. So say, for example, I've got a formulation that's got a little bit of amorphous component to it, and a lot of crystalline component to it. What's going to happen, the DSC will clearly show us the, the amorphous component as a TG prime. Okay, we see it. The microscope, when we do the microscopy, doesn't show collapse until well beyond the, the glass transition temperature. So what's going on? Well, if there's a little bit of amorphous material and a large crystalline, the crystalline material also acts as scaffolding. So what happens is we know the amorphous component is collapsing, but it's collapsing around the scaffolding, and we never see it as a physical loss of structure. So in those cases, assuming it doesn't affect the stability, um, yeah, we can drive well above the TG prime and still get a, a great, uh, great product, good physical, uh, great uh, chemical stability, possibly. So yeah, why not? If we can dry at higher temperatures, we can dry you know much faster. All right, I'll give it a few more seconds here to see if there are any more questions come in. Okay, got another question here. Um, what are the limitations of DSC and freeze-dry microscopy with new formulations such as nanoparticles? Well, that's a good question. Um, we've done a few nanoparticle formulations, and we've done a few uh, suspensions. Uh, generally, what we're seeing is the nanoparticles themselves don't play a role in the thermal properties of the formulation, meaning, you know, they're not going to they're not going to melt. Um, they're not going to necessarily crystallize. It's the solution that we're really concerned about. In some cases, what we'll do is we'll um, filter out the solids and run the liquid because that's what's going to be important on whether the sample is going to collapse or not. I mean, if you nanoparticles, we can see under the microscope, and we generally run nanoparticles depending on how large they are. But you're talking about a really large crystal size for a suspension. We would probably filter those out. Okay. If anybody else has any questions. Uh,